everybody. I really didn't set that up at all. Um, so, you know, please uh, forgive all, all of the kerfuffle, but I would like to say, didn't we do well? <laughs> um, I'm a professional artist in contemporary sculpture. I've been an artist for 25 years. I'm an RP sufferer. And above all else, I'm an acceptor. By that, I mean I have accepted my blindness and all the beautiful gifts, in fact, that I've found through my blindness. And with that today, I want to advocate the life that I lead is an extremely limitless one. And I'm going to share with you today all of the things that I, I do and I advocate, not just my profession, but many of my other interests. My early years with RP. I was first diagnosed when I was 19 years old with RP. So as you can imagine, an extremely impressionable time, if you like, a crossroads of your life, where you've got the whole future ahead of you. And I was already in art college studying graphic design. Prior to that, I'd fell in love with sculpture a couple of years before. So I knew that I wanted to be a sculptor. And it, more, in, more in fact, I wanted to be a lecturer of sculpture. So there's a very defined idea of what my future was going to be. But then I was told I was going blind <coughs> with RP. And as you can imagine, my whole world just fell apart in front of me. I didn't know what RP was. I'd never heard of it. I certainly didn't realise it was a progressive di disease that was going to take my vision, unfortunately. As the years went in the early stages, for me, life really did change quite dramatically. I think you would agree with me, if you are a fellow RP sufferer, that initially sight loss is about loss. It's about grief. It's about trying to realise that you you no longer will be able to do perhaps as much as you thought you would be doing. So when you suffer loss and you suffer grief, you need a healing process. And for me, that's what I had to do. I'd got into a really prestigious course in university at Staffordshire. I had won a place out of 28 people in the whole of Europe. I had to walk away from that because I had no independent skills, no mobility aids to be able to live in an independent way as a young visually impaired person. Then I lost my driver's license. Way before this, I lost the person that I thought I was gonna marry. So three very close together losses. That was put me into an extremely dark place for a few years to be fair. But there's only so long you can stay in a dark place. There's only so long that you can actually think, I don't fit in. Because that's what I used to think. I used to think, I don't fit in. I, I'm in limbo. I, neither am I in the blind world, or I, I'm certainly not in the sighted world. Where do I belong? That's a really hard one to live with, actually. Now, really, it's only been recently, in the past three years, that my life has changed in a much, much more positive way which I'll be sharing with you in a little while. My career as a professional sculptor. So I licked my wounds for a couple of years and I had that healing process going on. And what helped me with that was the realisation that although I didn't go to university to do the figurative sculpture degree, I still had those skills right there. They was always in me and I was never going to lose them. I just needed the belief that I could still do it. So I donned a chisel and mallet, really for therapeutic reasons, and I started to sculpt. That really proved to me that my future was as a sculptor. And very quickly, I started to sculpt for local galleries and small works that were being sold. Here's two of the works on, on the screen there that i done in a figurative way, and they were both sold in local galleries. Started by word of mouth, but slowly but surely, commissions were coming my way. I've also had a career in teaching, so teaching has been a big part of my life as well. But sculpture has always been that constant thing. After I decided to leave teaching and go into sculpture in a much more full way, really that's when my career rocketed. 
I had an exhibition called Through the Eyes of Time. That was my debut exhibition. It was completely self-curated and it toured the South East and actually was in London in 2015. I was invited to exhibit at the House of Commons, which was an incredible honour. And I think for me, that's when my career really, really did rock it because it was, it was on the television, it was on the BBC, it was in national magazines. And I found myself my, and my profile becoming much, much bigger. And that's really helped me realise initially the potential that my life could have through my work. I create my work in a very tactile way. I think sculpture, out of all of the arts, is probably the most tactile. Therefore, for me to do sculpture, it just seemed natural. I was initially trained as a graphic designer, so as you can imagine, that, that would be much more difficult as a visually impaired person. Whereas sculpture was something that was much more open to me. Mind, body and spirit. Mind, body and spirit for me is really about alternative routes into looking into how to realise that you have greater potential and in fact you can live a limit, limitless life. With mind, it's all about how you view yourself. If you think you're a second-rate citizen, which I did for many, many years, or if you feel that you're not good enough and you don't have much self-worth because of your impairment, that will put you in a very limit, limiting place of which to live. And that limiting place is so restrictive, so I needed to change that. I met the most wonderful lady who is a holistic counsellor. She's been with me and still is, we still work together, working on my self-development and how I can move through perhaps everyday challenges that come my way. This includes mindfulness. I think mindfulness is an incredible tool because it keeps us in the now. It's all very well us projecting, and believe you me, I'm a projector. I will look into weeks and weeks and years and years ahead, and I would miss what's going on now. And to be honest, in fact, I think it's the universe set that alarm off because it made me put myself in the now because I was sitting down there actually terrified. <laughs> so. It's actually done me a favour because it's, it's a reminder. You know, it's like, Victoria, you are here. Be here. Be with what is happening now. Because, of course, research is vital and it gives people hope. But what also is, in, I think, equally as important is to realise that we have to find our way with sight loss. Right now, we have to find adaptive ways to live with it and accept it. And that's really what I'm actually all about. Embracing the cane. So embracing the cane, what a story. I have found the, the nemesis of my life has been a long cane. Many organisations have come and gone with not much kind of uh, luck with me with the cane. My cane initially was a symbol cane and may I say did a wonderful job holding up my rubber plant in my front room. <laughs> but there, only, there really is only so many accidents you can have. And as you live with a progressive disease, you start to have more accidents and injuries. And I needed to keep myself safe. So I did succumb to learning the long cane. I contacted guide dogs. Initially, we were thinking about going along that particular line using a, a guide dog. But I have a wonderful, wonderful little dog, and he's a little Westy, but he would not allow another dog into the house. <laughs> so it became very, very apparent that, uh, yeah, that's not going to happen. So it was the cane or, or nothing, really. And it was the best thing I ever did. Really, really was the best thing I ever did. I should have learnt that cane years ago when I was a youngster because I think it opened me up. It made me realise that in my blindest of situations, which for me still is at night, I have 5% vision at the moment, which is very residual, but I'm completely blind at night. I haven't been out on my own for 20 years. 20 years, and all of a sudden, I was able to have independence at night on my own, walking my little dog. And that was the most liber liberating feeling that I could ever, ever experience. And that's why I really do, really do advocate that 
if you're somebody that is pushing mobility aids away, please perhaps think about inviting them into your world because it will open you up and it will give you independence. And in fact... May the force be with you. Accepting my blindness. So that really is the word of the day. Fly, freedom and acceptance. That is the title of my exhibition. May we all fly in the face of adversity. And my accepting my blindness really did come when I learned to use my long cane. Because it showed me my most blinded situation wasn't so scary after all. There's no need to be afraid. There's things that you can find within it that you won't ever have as a sighted person. Look at all the wonderful sensory experiences that us as visually impaired people have. And boy, do we have them, right? Sometimes it's not so great when, the, when the, you, know, you have such a good sense of smell and there's not something so pleasant. Or <laughs> you, know, you have the superpower hearing and someone's talking about you and they're not saying something very nice. But nevertheless, they are incredible senses. And I think the sighted world are missing out on using those senses. I would say they only use about 20% of them because the world is a very visually orientated place. And I think, really, we're quite, we're quite privileged to have that full range of senses. Above all else, I'm about breaking barriers. I'm about limitless life and embracing everything I possibly can not just with my profession, but with the things that I'm involved in. I'm a surfer. Yes, I hear. Oh, what? A surfer. I learned to surf four years ago. I was registered blind in 2004. I wasn't afraid of learning as a blind person. I couldn't wait to get in those waves. And it's the most liberating thing ever. To ride a wave with no obstacles in your way in the ocean is so freeing. It's all about freedom, and I absolutely love it. Again, skateboarding is something, it's a very cultural surfing thing to do. It's a board sport. I go skating along my canal. I have my left, in my left hand, I have my cane helping me navigate. It might look a bit strange. In fact, just the other day, I had somebody actually stop me and go, what's that? And I, I thought, oh, they must be talking about the cane, right? So I said, oh, it, it's, a, it's a mobility aid. I'm, I'm registered blind. Oh, OK, oh, wow, there should be more people like you that with disabilities that just get out there and kick the hell out of life. And do you know what? I just thought, yeah, I just educated you. That's really cool. And then I carried on. So at the end of the day, if, if I'm being seen doing maybe a little bit out of the ordinary, I think that's a good thing because I think it advocates to do whatever you want to do. You can do it. You can achieve everything you want to achieve with a really adaptive mind. Accessibility plays a very big part of it, but more importantly, your own personal acceptance of blindness. Now, I really wanted to celebrate that just back in February. I had a debut exhibition, Blind to Sixth Sense. It's never been done in this country until February. I put six sculpted pieces. Each piece represented a scent, a, a, a sense. And within that, I put them all into a pitch black gallery space because I wanted to invite the audience, the public, to view the work in a completely different way. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, leave your vision at the door. Welcome to my world. And that was my, that was my mission statement, if you like. And it was phenomenal. It had 500 visitors. It raised £1,400 for guide dogs as a personal thank you for what they did for me. And above all else, I think it was an education for the public because they all had their own experience and they all interpret, interpreted the work differently. We had sight. That was obviously depicted with an eye. We had sound, which I'd like to point out, is actually in the fly, Freedom and Acceptance, just down the hallway. It's an actual real working guitar, sculpted. That depicted sound. We have smell, which was a magnolia for its scent. Taste was a garlic for its incredible strong taste. 
touch, two hands holding a rose quartz. And the sixth sense, and the sixth sense for me was all about freedom and flying. And the bird as a dove, what depicts freedom better than flying. So that's what my message was. And to be fair, it's probably the most epiphany, if you, it's my epiphany work. It's, I don't think I'm ever going to beat that exhibition really because it had such an amazing response. And actually right now it's being considered to go into a national gallery at the Turner Contemporary. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it may well be 2020 or 2021. Here's a picture of me surfing a wave. I wear an armband that's got an eye with a line through it just to make people aware that we're in the water, that I'm in there. And on the left there, we have me skating with the cane in front of me. And on the right there, I think I'm just about to zoom down on a snowboard. Another, another crazy board sport that I, I really enjoy. And then we have my blinded soul skateboards, which I've just started to create. They're bespoke skateboards, so I'm diversifying my sculptural skills. And music. In fact, the piece of music that was playing at the start there is my music. I've been involved in music for about 23 years. I've been in and out of bands, and I've had a personal career of a producer as well. And I love to write music. It's one of a real creative process. I'm a, I am a creator, after all. I'm a creative person. So I do link with creativeness very much so. And music is, is just a wonderful way of expression. I sing, I play guitar, I play piano. I'm also a traveller. I spent quite a few years in my 20s, once I'd got my head around what was happening to me, I decided to don a backpack and go and see the world. And the ethos at the time was I want to see the world while I can and put all those memories in my mind so that I'll always have that beautiful beach with a pelican diving into it in Mexico. And it's probably, again, one of the greatest experiences because you could say, well, as a blind person, how can you enjoy travelling? Of course you can because travelling isn't just about what you see. It's also about who you meet the culture, the food, the experience as a whole. So I still do love travelling. There's myself and my husband at my recent exhibition. There's a picture there of our camper van when we go off on our surf trips. And there's a little Westie there pretending to be a, a surfer with a, with a surfboard. <laughs> he doesn't even like the water. <laughs> the importance of a support network. I think it's really important right now to actually really highlight the importance of, of support. In my life, most especially, my biggest rock is my husband. He really is an advocate of ad adaptivity. He supports me with all my crazy projects. And he, he listens to the rants as well as the joy. And I have wonderful family who are very supportive. They're very much doers, so if there's things that I need done, they will do so. I have a wonderful nephew who has just been brought up with me this way, so he knows no different. And he treats me the best way, actually, because he's never treated me any differently. So supporting is really important. And, of course, there are organisations like this one that are out there to support you with your sight loss. So I think if you can connect with people with sight loss, organisations that are people, for people with sight loss then you're going to have a good connective support system, which is really, really important. The three A's. So the three A's. The three A's for me. Acceptance, adaptivity, accessibility. So I've told you my acceptance was through my cane and was the freeing experience that I had. So once I'd accepted my blindness, I was able to adapt to my blindness. Because, ladies and gentlemen, you may think you are limited, but when you realise there are, you can do what you want to do. Yes, you'll have to do it in a different way. Yes, you may have to tack from left to right, but you do get there eventually. It's not as plain sailing as going straight, but hey, who wants to go straight? Sometimes it's more interesting taking the long route, right? 
So that's what my message is about. And then accessibility, to bring our environment into being much more aware of the needs of disabled people, visually impaired people, so that the world becomes a much more accessible place. My main aim today is to become somebody that you can reach out to. I'm currently mentoring some people in America that are suffering from RP. I'm already involved in a large group of extremely, incredibly talented blind and visually impaired people that are sharing their story. I know my future with RPFB looks bright. And I please urge you, if you are sitting there right now, if you, you're struggling with your sight loss, allow me to help you. I want to help you. All my details are just up there behind me. I've got a website, www.victoriaclare.com. That's purely for sculpture. But I've also got all the other details, and I'm obviously here, so please grab me. I do hope that this has given you a little bit of my life and also perhaps a model of what anyone's life with sight loss can be if they believe in that they can do it. Thank you very much. I'm